Okay, now it says I'm recording. Okay. Welcome everybody. We are uh, gonna get started in just a minute or two. Glad you're with us. Okay, now we're international, Bill, with uh, some people right. <laughs> Germany are watching. And I want to invite everybody to, to um, introduce yourselves in the, the chat. And as we get forward, go forward, you can feel free to use the Q&A uh, when we get to that part of it. Um, and maybe put in your, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do that in a minute. All right. Um, I'm going to go and get the Facebook started. Uh, Phil and Charles and um, everybody keep yourselves muted. And um, once so we're going to play a little video as we gather the Facebook audience, and then we'll get right into it. Uh, so again, welcome everybody that's just joined us. And if you uh, do Facebook, then you could go and find this feed, which go live in about a minute on the Death Penalty Action Facebook page and share it, please. And that will, oh, Alaska has joined us. Hi, Kathy. Um, and uh, so we're across the country here. All we need is Hawaii now. Um, anyway, uh, stand by, be prepared to share uh, on your Facebook, find it from the Death Penalty Action Facebook page. Nate, are you able to get that going? What do we want? When do we want it? Well, we are here uh, standing in solidarity with all the advocates across the country who are calling on the abolition of the death penalty. Execution, not solution. My son was wrongfully accused and falsely convicted of murder for hire. My little brother was executed in 2010 by firing squad, and, you know, it's kind of ruined my life, so I got post-traumatic stress. So I'm here to fight against the death penalty and I don't believe in it in no way, shape or form. My son was convicted and then the next day was sentenced to die. He had just turned 20. He's been in there 20 years now, a little over, and we're still fighting to get him home. When my younger brother, Paul, he was approached by a man named Dennis Sutar, who uh, stabbed him repeatedly, and my brother died shortly thereafter. We see Dennis literally falling through the cracks. There was no support system in place. Why? Because six months beforehand, the state of Connecticut cut all funding to help people like Dennis, the mentally ill, homeless, and poor. Dr. King felt so passionately about the death penalty. He said, it's society's final assertion that we will not forgive. And the death penalty is, simply put, a legalized modern day version of lynching. This country has been birthed out of imperialism, genocide, racism, and our posture as a country should be about humility and repentance. We're in a moment where we can see the end of the death penalty, and we can also see the spike that is coming. We're here today with our message, standing in solidarity as a people. This is what democracy looks like. Do not be complicit in the death penalty sponsored by the United States of America. The death penalty only creates more victims, more grieving families. We're here to abolish the death penalty and demolish the death house.
And good afternoon or late morning, as the case may be. My name is Abe Bonowitz. I'm the Executive Director of Death Penalty Action. And with me are Sue Host, who is our point person in Oklahoma, and Charles Keith, our uh, Impacted Communities Liaison. Um, Ali Sullivan is here in our Communications Department. And we're here with our special guest, Phil Hanston, Professor Phil Hanston um, out in California, who is the author of the new book. Book, death penalty bullshit. Um, we don't often have uh, foul language, <laughs> if you will, on this. And I'll tell you, you start to get into it, and you can't help but cuss. Um, but uh, but we're going to talk about that uh, today and hear how Phil came to write his book and talk about uh, what's in it and how you can get it and all that. Uh, but first, I want to make sure that we are uh, up to speed on what's happening in a uh, couple of cases that we're working very hard on. Uh, first, um, I want to go to Sue in Oklahoma. Uh, Sue, are you able to do that safely while you're driving and, and share a bit with us? Sure, I Abe. Well, welcome, uh, Sue. And if you can uh, introduce yourself a bit and uh, just uh, share a little bit about what uh, we'll, we'll talk about. But first, give us a little bit of introduction, how you come to this work. Sure. So um, I'm Sue Hosh, and I, uh, I joined Death Penalty Action through the work of the Julius Jones Coalition. And I've been working for about four years in the death penalty abolition work. And now I um, am in contact with all 25 of the death row uh, inmates in Oklahoma who have execution dates right now. Uh, thank you, Sue. And, and Sue comes to us, um, uh, she basically says, we met when Charles and I were going out last year to, uh, to support um, in the number of cases that were uh, that were scheduled at seven execution dates last uh, fall and in Oklahoma, and there were uh, they got four of them, and we were fighting every single one of them, and that was a big part of our purpose was to say it's not just one person, it's all of these, and that's when Sue said, "Hey, I want to help." So, um, and and now we've got her leading the charge with us in Oklahoma. So there's space for everybody who wants to do something and step up and shows up. And Sue's one of those people. And one of the places that she showed up to yesterday was the clemency hearing for James Coddington, who's the next person scheduled to be executed in Oklahoma later this month on the 25th. Sue, what was it like at the, at the clemency hearing yesterday? Anything different about this new makeup of the board? We do have two new board members. Um, yes, it was a little bit different. We have a new, um, of course, we have a new chair uh, since Adam Luck uh, resigned from the board last year. So it was a little bit of a different feel. Um, and yesterday, the, uh, the state people presented their case by Zoom. So that was a little different. The room had a different feel to it, less, less state people in the room. Um, uh, I sat across the row from James Coddington's family, who um, it was it was very somber being there with them. His brother was there. He sat with his head down and and wringing his hands the whole time. Um, it was you know just a very somber feeling. There were no family there of the victim at all, which is unusual. Um, uh, you know, it was it was a very different feeling. Um, we had a lot of advocates there, which was great. Um, some with death penalty action, and um, we were wearing our shirts, so that was great. Um, the board did not ask many questions. That was a different feel from typical um, board board operations. Normally they ask a whole lot of questions. This time they, they didn't ask questions of the state, of the of the defense, or of James Coddington, which we felt like was a whole different feel. Um, and so, you know, that was that was something that was um, different for us. And um, you know, going into the vote, I honestly felt like it was going to be a no. Um, 
So we were all shocked when when they voted for clemency because you know Richard Smotherman, one of the board members, um, he's di very difficult to read and and uh, you know he's always a no vote. Um, so when he said yes, you know there was a big sigh among us um, because. Uh, he's somebody who we just always assume is going to be a no vote. Um, was it a was it a sigh or a gasp? <laughs> well, for me it was a sigh, but I think maybe some was a gasp. I I was holding my breath and and I just I was stunned. Um, I I don't know. He he is someone who is so difficult to read and. And again, didn't ask many questions. The one question he asked of, of the defense was um, whether or not the other family members or, or what was the outcome of the other family members who grew up in the same environment. And, um, you know, she didn't have a, an answer for that. And I thought to myself, well, you know, they did not go on to, to kill anyone. And, and so, you know, I thought, well, you know, he's going to say, well, they didn't kill anybody, so he's not going to vote for, for clemency, um, even though they grew up in this horrible situation, too. And that was my thought behind why he asked the question. But um, and, and then in, in the discussion, um, the other the other member, Bishop Ed, he, he asked, you know, how do we determine how to vote? and which I thought was an interesting question. And, uh, you know, he said, well, I look at what the other people in the family or the other people who grew up in the situation did, um, you know, in the same situation, but it turns out that they all did go on to, you know, commit crimes and do other things like that. And, and many, you know, did commit felonies and robberies and burglaries and such to, to get drugs. And so I think that's what he was looking at not the fact that they committed murder. Um, they did go on. So, so you're breaking up a little bit. And, um, and so, um, situation. Yeah, well that, um, Sorry it's, about that. It's okay, you broke up for a second, but we got you back. Um, you know, there's so much we could talk about and we do need to do a whole program just about Oklahoma, but I'm grateful to have that report. And uh, do you want to just share briefly what we're up to in a couple of weeks? Sure. So um, on the weekend of August 19th and 20th and 21st, we have our Oklahoma Death Penalty Coalition annual meeting. And around that, the Death Penalty Action Group is going to be hosting a number of events with Shane Claiborne. Um, we have a, um, a legislative meeting scheduled with the um, a group of Republican legislators in coordination with uh, a group of Catholic uh, Charities members, our Catholic Coalition. And um, we also have a group called Flourish OKC who's scheduling in conjunction with us a group of faith leaders who are going to meet with Shane and um, try to come up with some ideas for working on so we're, we're, we're losing you again um, but we'll fill in wait Oh, I'm frozen. Charles, can you hear no, Sue or I? To get started off the table temporarily. So that uh, execution stopped in Oklahoma. She's breaking up pretty bad. Yeah, uh, so you're breaking up pretty bad, but can you hear me okay, Charles? Yes, okay. yes. Sue, thanks so much, and uh, stick around if you can. and. We do need to do a whole program about just about Oklahoma, but the bottom line is we'll be sharing information about what's happening. And because we have this um, very unusual, unexpected situation with a coming to recommendation from the new 
Board of Pardons in Oklahoma. It's an especially important time to be contacting Governor Stitt in Oklahoma and asking him to respect this recommendation from the Board of Pardons in Oklahoma and actually grant clemency and not to string it out for weeks and weeks, but to just do it as soon as you can. So there's an action about that uh, available to you. If you don't have it in your email, it's at deathpolityaction.org. And that's where the, it, that's at. And we took a little bit more time than I planned on for Oklahoma, which is, um, uh, but we can fill in the other thing we wanted to talk about, which is the next execution in the United States uh, into the conversation that we're about to have with, with uh, uh, Phil Hanston, who is the author of this brand new book, Death Penalty Bullshit, 15 Absurd Claims of Death Penalty Supporters. Um, and you're gonna hear a few words that you might be not be used to hearing and don't be able to forgive us for that and accept that that's coming with this conversation. Uh, Phil, I just got this in the mail. Um, you sent me copies the other day. I haven't had a chance to do much perusing, but I have looked uh, through it a little bit. And I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to host you and have this conversation. Can you just introduce yourself a little bit and how you came to this uh, topic? Certainly. And thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this. I really, and I have such admiration for all of you people that have been doing this a lot longer than I have. So, I, so again, thanks for the invitation. Uh, yeah, my scientific background is uh, drug interactions, which I've been doing for about 50 years. Uh, and about 30 years ago, I started working in the, uh, became a serious student of philosophy. The, those finger puppets you see on, back here are all my philosopher buddies there. And most of the books you see here and, and elsewhere you can't see are all philosophy books. Um, and then what really uh, opened my eyes to the death penalty was about 10 years ago, I was asked to weigh in on a lethal injection issue uh, with a, somebody who was working with Amnesty International and, uh, uh, you know, as a, because of my pharmacology background. And I, I did a deep dive in, you know, I'd always been against the death penalty, but I didn't think about it much. And at that point, 10 years ago, I did a deep dive into it. And I read the two books that I think uh, are the best books ever written on the death penalty, uh, Albert Camus, uh, Reflections on the Guillotine, Arthur Kessler, Refle Reflections on uh, Hanging. They were written in the 1950s, a, a companion. They were written together. They were buddies. Uh, one won the Nobel Prize, the other one uh, for literature, the other one was nominated several times. Um, and they're just outstanding, uh, philosophically oriented, uh, rigorously documented uh, uh, books on the death penalty. But then the epiphany came in 2015, <laughs> the real epiphany. I, I got a, a hold of the transcript of a debate between two death penalty supporters. It was an intelligence squared debate. Uh, you can get this transport on or the transcript online. Um, in 2015, two death penalty supporters, two death penalty opponents uh, debating. And these death penalty supporters were the leading experts. I mean, that's why they picked them. This was a, a worldwide debate and uh, they picked the two best people that they could find. These people testify in front of Congress. They, their writings appear in front of the US Supreme Court. I mean, these are the big, the big guns. Um, so I was truly astonished when I saw, I saw the kinds of arguments they put up. Uh, you know, in, in science and in philosophy too, uh, we seek truth. Uh, we never get there, but that's what we're after. You know, we never get there because everything in science is in principle replaceable by some, something that's a little better. But what they were trying to do was the opposite. They were trying to conceal the truth. And it was pretty obvious from the start, that's all they were doing. They weren't uh, presenting any uh, rational arguments. Um, they committed the cardinal sin in science of not basing their conclusions on the evidence. <laughs> they did that repeatedly, but then they committed all sorts of fallacies and crimes of reason and things that I teach philosophy of science, and I talk about all these fallacies in my class. They committed virtually every one. So then I was just, you know, I said, this cannot be. These people are the experts the, in the United States on the death penalty, and they are committing all of these uh, these crimes. And here's the, the 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 kicker: they won the debate with all this garbage. <laughs> they you know they pulled the the audience. There was a, a live audience there. They pulled them before the debate and pulled them after the debate, 
And the death penalty supporters uh, won the debate. They, they looked to see how many people switched their, their view based on the debate. And that was too much for me. So hence the book. <laughs> I, yeah. I just couldn't stand to see that. <clears throat> well, that that's, and this debate was when? Uh, 2015. And so it was uh, not that long ago. No, it was in, it was sponsored by Intelligence Squared. And I also uh, for for the book, I also went to uh, Justice Scalia's statements, which uh, many of them are are pretty bizarre. Uh, there's a guy named John McAdams who died a couple of years ago, who's a professor at Marquette, who is another person who uh, testifies in front of Congress, et cetera, or used to. Um, and his arguments, which we can talk about later if you want, uh, were, were also, he wasn't in the debate, but uh, they're also just uh, absurd. I mean, that's why I use the word absurd. I mean, that's, there is no other way to describe their arguments because they don't have anything. They got nothing. So they have to make stuff up. We've got all the evidence on our side. <laughs> they got nothing. So they're forced to obfuscate and bully and badger and do all those kind of things. <clears throat> in my experience, and by the way, Kim in the chat has put um, a link to an NPR story. I presume about that. I haven't had a chance to look at the link, but it's in, they're in the chat. And I'll, I do want to invite everybody uh, to introduce yourselves in the chat and where you're watching from. And, and you can put questions there or use the Q&A function um, to offer a question. Um, you know, in, in my own experience, uh, I've been a part of campaigns that have abolished the death penalty in New Jersey, New Mexico, Illinois, Connecticut, Maryland, Nebraska, which got overturned, but then uh, New Hampshire, uh, Colorado, Virginia, some more than others. Certainly those early ones, I was present in the final floor debates. And we and, and when I haven't been able to be there, I'm always trying to watch them. And it's what I end up calling legislative waterboarding. You have all the product <laughs> on your side and they're coming up with every possible reason to have a death penalty real and imagined. You know, what about this guy? What about this person who did this horrible thing? Um, and, uh, and I'm glad that within your book, you address people that are guilty. But I know that it, the first six chapters, I think, are about innocence issues. And is there a reason that you chose to frame it out that way? Yes, there absolutely is. Because in my view, and you you all would, uh, Abe, you and others would know this better than I would know it, but it seems to me that this is their Achilles heel and uh, nobody wants to execute innocent people. So uh, that is something that they have to really pull out all the guns to try to, to argue against it. And the most absurd arguments uh, are, are in that, uh, that innocent. Okay, so what do they do? They start with, um, I mean, some of them are, are uh, their arguments are just pathetic, but they, they start by claiming, okay, the 189 people that were exonerated and released, they were actually all guilty, which as we, <laughs> they actually say that, um, and or at least most of them were guilty, which is preposterous. All you have to do is look at the Death Penalty Information Center and look at all the data and the reasons why they were exonerated and all that. Uh, so that's just false. It's just a false statement that they make that those 189 uh, people are, and even if a few of them were guilty, you still have like 170 or 160 people that were exonerated and released who were factually innocent. So even if a few of them are, uh, which is possible, um, then it, their argument uh, doesn't work anyway. Uh, so then they, they just kind of bully and bluff their way through, through that. Then, then they attack um, the, gross, the Samuel Gross study that, uh, that over 4% of people that we send to death row are innocent. Uh, that one that came out, what, five years ago or so? Uh, uh, Samuel Gross is a, a law professor at the University of Michigan. I think he just retired. And I've corresponded with him to make sure I've got his data correct. And so the stuff I put in the book uh, has been cleared through <laughs> my discussions with Samuel Gross. And uh, this is a very, very well done study. And they had two law professors, a statistician and a medical researcher all got together to produce this. Uh, and yet then uh, they do things like, for example, in this uh, death penalty um, debate that I talked about, they, they did stuff like uh, saying one of them, Barry Sheck was one of the, and he did, Barry did a great job on the, on the anti-death penalty side, but, but they, they started attacking him and they said, well, Barry, you know that 4% uh, figure is ridiculous and, uh, and you know it. 
And you know that kind of fact-free kind of uh, of bullying, and they did, and the two of them got together and just started throwing all this uh, bullying and badgering and bluffing uh, at Barry. And so the truth never came out. Uh, you know, it was just left that way, and that's why the audience didn't get it. So, uh, so that's the other thing they they do is they try to discredit the Gross study. And Gross, by the way, just as an aside, uh, Gross used a very imaginative way of looking at this. He used what's called a Kaplan Meyer survival analysis uh, to come up with his figures. And we use that in our drug interaction studies. We use that exact same kind of analysis in our drug interaction studies. And uh, Robert Blecker, who was one of the people for the death penalty, uh, tried to imply that he understood the statistics. And I knew, I knew he didn't, but he mm -hmm. tried to imply that. And then la he later admitted he didn't. But uh, I mean, Blecker doesn't know Kaplan Meyer from Oscar Meyer. I mean, it, it's just, uh, it was just preposterous that he thought he could understand it. Robert Blecker is one of my favorites. He's, he shows up, he's one of the few people that they can get to show up at these things. Um, we, he was there as part of a um, the series of, uh, there was a death penalty study commission in New Jersey, you know, before that five public hearings before we abolished the death penalty in New Jersey. But he was one of those people. And yeah, you know, he talks about this thing. He, he likes to talk about how, you know, prison is actually a country club and, yeah. and, and how, uh, you know, and he says he opposes the death penalty for a lot of people, but it's supposed to be for the worst of the worst. And that was his, his primary argument. Um, <laughs> you, you know, uh, it, Charles, I wanted to invite you to, to just uh, offer any, I mean, I, I told Charles we were doing this today. He hasn't seen the book at all yet, um, but he said, uh, Charles, remind me what you said about the, this book. I said, I wouldn't even have to read it. <laughs> how many times have how many times have you heard me say bullshit <laughs> and, and that's putting it nicely so yes. and charles has a brother that was wrongly convicted and we're we're going to see him free yes. soon, but, um, yes. you know i i also you know agree with him the words i use is shenanigans and underhandedness you know, that's the better way I could per se call a lie. I call them shenanigans and underhandedness, but in reality, they're <laughs> lies. So yeah. we can break it all the way down and call it bullshit. But, you know, the, I wanted to say something. I wanted to read something to you that came from Ohio Supreme Court judge. I won't give his name, but this is the way that some of them think. And it says that I voted to uphold Kevin Key's conviction and that he should have the death penalty. But that is an exact example of why the law should go away. Keith's family came to his aid in a very aggressive way. Most people on death row do not have anyone who cares about them that way. Why would that have anything to do with that? People, families caring about someone. Most of these people on death row's family is poor, devastated, dysfunctional. So just to have any type of a family that you can even put together to stand up against the death penalty, that's ludicrous. They're gonna always find you weak in that aspect. And, you know, and that was a Supreme Court justice. But here's some stuff that they said in the courts that did not exist. We found them. They said that this evidence where they wrote down my brother's name on the notes had got lost in the trash somewhere before my brother was arrested. Well, I found it. And here they are. And this is why my brother is still alive. See, I found all the stuff that they said they didn't have. I got it. They said well, that there was no... It, it, we're talking about the bullshit of That's right. hidden evidence. That's right. And they sent me, and I have this on a letter when I requested this stuff. They says, we do not have it. And, you know, that's another story, but we don't have the phone logs. Well, some gentleman, I'm not sure why he did what he did, but he started investigating and he won $1.4 million. Hmm. And he gave us the phone logs that we had been looking for. Here they are. But they said that it didn't exist. This is why Kevin Keith is still alive. We found it's not so much as what you say in trial or in court, it's what they leave out. It's the connecting pieces. That's why you don't hear a lot of ands, but you hear a lot of if, ors, nors, and fors, but you not ands, because they don't connect. And that's why it's bullshit. Yeah, thank and, you. And, and, and then when you're trying to deliver something to the people, it sounds choppy and in pieces. So everybody lets it go. We're going to hear more about that uh, with regard to Kosul and in, in Texas in a few minutes. But um, uh, Phil, 
How long did you spend working on this book? And by the way, one of the people asked a question in the Q and A. Um, if the the that debate is addressed in this book, I presume that it is. But again, having had this just a, a last a two days in front of me, I haven't had a chance to read it thoroughly. So, do you want to talk about the number one? Is the debate um, addressed directly in the book? I presume it is, and also. Uh, um, What's the piece of this that speaks the most to you? Well, I think that, uh, you know, I kind of, there's so many issues, you know, uh, cost and the lack of deterrence and all those kinds of things, which I cover in there, but but uh, briefly, and, and you, Abe, and others have done a great job of covering a lot of those things. So I figured that I would really focus on the, uh, the claims made by the death penalty, penalty supporters. So the uh, the debate is comes up in there a lot. Uh, so I cover the, uh, a lot of the statements they make in the debate, but I also cover uh, comments made by uh, by various politicians. Uh, Scalia comes up a number of times, as you might guess. Um, and also there's the, the, the guy I mentioned earlier, uh, McAdams, who, um, and it, his arguments were insidious. He's the, he was the person, was a professor at Marquette. And his are, those are the worst kind of arguments, the ones that have surface plausibility. So what he said was, well, it's okay if we execute innocent people now and then because look at other public policy issues like speed limits and uh, you know, making uh, building codes and, and drug approval process. People die as a result of the public policy things, uh, decisions we make there. So therefore, basically, and I hate to use the word again, but uh, he, he didn't use these words, but shit happens. That's basically what he said. Hey, innocent people getting executed. Well, shit happens. Well, it's uh, philosophically, and I won't get into the weeds on this, but this is what any freshman philosophy major would tell you. This is a category error. He's comparing things that are along a spectrum where you're choosing speed limits along a spectrum of things. And the death penalty versus uh, life in prison is a binary choice. It's an either or choice. There's no comparison whatsoever between speed limits and killing innocent people, none. And yet he gets away with this kind of thing. So I do, um, the, the, um, the uh, debate is covered heavily. A lot of Scalia comments are covered because he said a lot of really stupid stuff and, uh, and, and then miscellaneous politicians and, and pundits I cover. In, uh, so I try to use their actual words so I'm not making, you know, I'm not using uh, not straw men. I'm actually saying, okay, they said this and here's how that plays out. Yeah, that uh, reminds me, there are a couple of good things that Scalia said. Um, one of which was, you know, people who come and protest at the court need to go across the street to the Capitol and change the law. So that's an important thing that, that motivates the way I do my work. Um, but hold on, Charles. And, and also um, he said, uh, this is Justice Scalia. He said, um, if there were really innocent people being executed, they'd be shouting it from the rooftops. And and that's a big part of what our movement is doing now. And, and um, you know, I want to invite Ali Sullivan, who's here with us, too. She's been um, pulling together all the data around this guy that's scheduled to be executed in Texas, who claims to be innocent. Um, and and then, um, Phil, I want to invite you to react to what she's saying, because you have a whole chapter here about forensics. And, you know, we're so blessed to have you, a scientist, um, to, to get into some of that, too. So, Ali, can you just lay out some of the uh, issues with, um, with, uh, with Kosul's case? Yes, there are many, many issues with Kosul's case. Um, when I first met Kosul, he was pointing out the forensic junk science, which is definitely a huge part of his case. Um, kind of the three linchpins of his case are bite mark evidence, um, the physical impression of the bite mark, as well as DNA found in, or DNA not found in the bite mark. Um, so the state said that the bite mark um, matched Kosul. However, his defense um, expert said that there was nothing that could be conclusively 
um, ascertain from this bite mark because skin is elastic and it it's just not a um, credible scientific discipline um, for forensic use. And um, what's really concerning also is that for somebody who was supposedly the murderer of Miss Sarah Walker in 2006, Kusul's DNA was never found in the bite mark on Sarah Walker's neck. Um, in addition, the witnesses were hypnotized. Um, there was only two witnesses that may have seen Kosul the day of the crime, but not actually at the time around when the body was found. Um, and they were hypnotized. And as a result, they described a man of Asian descent and the the forensic sketch, as Charles points out very often, literally looks like it could be virtually anybody. Um, not only the descriptions, but the forensic sketch that was used are so ambiguous that it does not um, clearly point to Kosul. In addition, there's really scanty DNA evidence. Um, and part of what's happening right now in Kosul's case is one of his attorneys requested more funding from one of the courts um, to further test the DNA because one of his other attorneys did not want to test the DNA because um, DNA was supposedly found underneath the victim's fingernails. Um, Kosul says that he was in the house the morning before the murder because it was a model home that was just open for people to come through. Um, but he maintains that he did not kill Sarah Walker. So the expert that they're trying to hire, um, if they get this DNA funding, is an expert in DNA transfer and to see how DNA may have gotten under the fingernails and how much was under the fingernails. Um, but the DNA in Coastal's case was not found anywhere else important um, relating to the crime. It was not found on the plant stand that was used to bludgeon the victim. Um, of course, his DNA was not found in the bite mark. And likewise, um, Sarah Walker's murder was really gruesome. She was stabbed 33 times, bludgeoned and bitten on the neck. It was very bloody. Um, no DNA evidence was ever found on Kosul. So it's... So, I, that, that's way more than anybody can, can respond to in a few minutes. But... but. <laughs> Um, but I want to give you that chance to, 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 to fill us in a little bit, Phil. But first, I just want to give a shout out to our friends in Alaska, where Delia Perez Meyer and Kathy Harris are watching and, and they're having their big annual fish fry tonight. Uh, I got to be the guest speaker at that last year. But, um, but hi, Kathy and Delia and everybody and everybody else that's watching. Yes. But, but Phil, go right ahead. Okay, well, yeah, the scientific thing, uh, I do cover that because, you know, given my background in science and uh, after uh, Gavin Newsom uh, did the moratorium on executions here in California, uh, it brought out from the woodwork all the crazies. And uh, there was a, a, a politician here in California who said, well, we don't have to worry about executing the innocent because science will solve it all. And uh, so, you know, new, new developments in science will eliminate any, uh, you know, anybody any innocent person going to death row. And I, I go through, as you mentioned, uh, Abe, I do have a chapter on this. Uh, and I go through uh, a bunch of reasons. I typically list uh, several reasons why they, I make their statement and then I go through the reasons why it's wrong. The first one is scientific certainty. As I said at the beginning, uh, we don't get that. Scientific certainty is a myth. Um, any non-trivial statement about science is provisional and every decent scientist knows that. So that's number one. Uh, the second reason I give is that uh, scientists and technicians are not infallible. Uh, even, uh, even if they're good, uh, they're not infallible and they can make mistakes. They can mix up a, a sample with some other sample. They can put the wrong reagent in. Any, any kind of thing can happen. And science can be perverted. My third reason is science can be perverted. Uh, if you have a scientist with, uh, I've done a lot of expert witness stuff uh, in civil trials on drug interactions. And I'm just amazed at the, you know, I was usually involved in defending a physician who was uh, accused of giving a drug interaction that caused harm to the patient. And I would only take them if it was clear to me as a drug interaction person that, that there was no connection. They made a mistake, the doc made a mistake, but it didn't cause the adverse outcome. 
And so I would say this to the lawyers I was helping, and I'd say, uh, but how can any expert on drug interactions would come to the same conclusion I did? And he, and then he would say, uh, typically, well, yeah, but uh, they'll find somebody. You can, if you give them money, you dangle money in front of, of people, uh, you can find people to say whatever you want. And it was true. Every time I testified in court, they found somebody, uh, they dug up somebody to, to say the exact opposite. And then the, the, the poor jury is sitting there going, well, which one is right? I don't know anything about cytochrome P453A4. So what, what's, the, what's the real answer? So you put the judge who is usually not scientifically uh, literate or many of them aren't and the juries who often aren't and so they don't know. Uh, so, and then the other thing is that in the courtroom, the fourth reason I give is in the courtroom, science becomes a partisan sport. And uh, it just goes back and forth. And uh, then the, the people in the, the jury and the judge are, are are going, well, what's the real answer here? So science will not save us <laughs> from uh, sending innocent people. Sorry, that was long-winded, but. <clears throat> that, that's okay. The, the um, I mean, we see science being used or the idea that we're bringing in the, the experts and, uh, you know, I've been sat in hearings where you know, they had the voir dire people, they will interview them prior to uh, allowing the jury to hear what they're saying. And I'm always astounded at how much is not allowed in. Right. Have you ever had any kind of experience like that? And why? Can you explain to us a little bit why that might happen? Well, no, I've seen that happen in my own experience in testifying at trials. And uh, it's uh, it's kind of a mystery. I, we need a legal expert to answer that. And I'm not, I'm not a legal expert. So, uh, I do not know, but I've seen it happen over and over again, and I've wondered about that myself. Why is this not allowed? And that's a, a legal issue, so we need a lawyer to help us with that. Uh, Charles? I wanted to speak on that, you know, because I know in order to be a judge, you have to have a certain level of education, prosecutor, certain level of education, defense attorneys, certain level of education, but yet to be a juror, you can sit on the jury and you have no clue what these guys are using these big long words and how to follow <laughs> the legal system. The jury sitting up there lost. You see them swaying back this way. So that's where the, that's when that bullshit comes into work. But I've been able to break mine down even a little bit more elementary because most of the people that are most likely to go through this process are gonna be the poor and the minorities. So I explained to them by the story of the Salem witch trials. They were executing all these witches. They were pointing to everybody that was a witch until they pointed to the governor's wife. That ended that. So until you start seeing wealthy people being executed, until you see the death penalty come into their lives, it's not going to be that big an issue. I also use the king's clothing when I talk about courage. It takes kids to come out and tell the truth and have courage. You're going to always have the adults say, what they feel is necessary to say. So, you know, you got to keep it on, on that lower level too and try to explain it to the people that this is most likely to happen to. So when they stopped those Salem witch trials because that governor did not want to execute his own <laughs> wife, it, it, it got their attention. And also I want to show this here. And everybody asked me, this is the, 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 the uh, signature of Governor Ted Strickland. And I'm going to tell you why this is so important to me. Because this could have been on a death warrant. And it's not. This is to help my brother get out of prison. This is him stating, had he not lost the election, what his next moves were to release my brother. So, I mean, that signature means an awful lot because most of the time you get a governor's signature, it's on that death warrant. So kudos to Ohio and, and Ted Strickland for what he did for our family. <laughs> you know, Charles, one of the things that came up in, in your case, and we've seen this so much, especially in, in Oklahoma around Joyce Gilchrist, the, um, uh, the dis discredited uh, forensic scientist there, but there's also one of those in, in Ohio who worked for the Ohio yeah. Bureau of Criminal Investigation and, and was yes. even suggesting that a, an imprint in a snowbank proved somebody's license plate. I mean, crazy yes. stuff like that. Um, so. Uh, Phil, I, I, I want to come back to you and ask um, if there was a chapter in this book that's a favorite for you, which one is it and why? Well, I think it's probably uh, 
the afterword, which is after the 16th chapter. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's where you were. Well, I tried to just kind of summarize and, and focus on what I thought were the most uh, important points. And uh, so I think that because I, I cover four points in the afterword and uh, two of the points I cover in there, I um uh, I think are really critically important, but they're not, they're very rarely brought up in the uh, death penalty uh, debate. And, um, and that is uh, the issue of free will. And uh, anybody that's worked in philosophy uh, understands that this is a huge question and it's unresolved and maybe unresolvable question. Uh, we have to assume we have free will, but it's only a theory and science would actually suggest that we don't have it. So what basically what we're doing, as I describe in the afterward, is we're executing people based on a an unproven theory. That's number one. But the second part, that the free will issue, the reason I, I put most of it in the appendix because I have extensive coverage of it in the in the appendix because it's it really is important. It's just a, it gives most people a Charlie horse in their brain to think about it. So uh, I I brought this up with my students repeatedly over the last 20 years and some of them love it and some of them just their eyes glaze over it <laughs> and they have difficulty with it but it is just summarize it free will is is only a theory but even more important is the fourth one that's in that afterward and that is the limits of human understanding and that is something that applies to all sorts of things uh, what well, applies to everything uh, there are limits and this is a philosophical issue there are things that that we know that's here. Then there are things that that are in principle knowable, but we don't know yet. That's this stuff here. And then there's almost certainly stuff over here that's unknowable. But the the the, the stuff that we don't know yet, which I forget where that is, but the stuff that we don't know yet uh, are things like what really what are the sources of human behavior? We we've only barely scratched the surface. The human brain is the most complicated thing in the universe as far as we know uh, and we really don't know what are the sources of human behavior so most as you know you all know better than me most of the people on death row have been abu horribly abused as children or uh, you know mental illnesses and all sorts of horrible things the question that never seems to get asked is were it not for that horrible abuse they experienced as a child were it not for that would they have committed that murder that is an intrinsically unanswerable question there is no way to answer that question of were it not for that abuse or that mental illness or that whatever it is were it not for that would they have committed the murder we don't know the only way to solve this is to do away with the death penalty then we are miraculously absolved of trying to figure that out we don't have to figure that out they go to prison for a really long time we don't have to decide whether that child abuse, you know, the the uh, Golden State Killer here in California, horrible guy, horrible, horrible guy. Well, he had some horrible stuff happen to him as a kid, and that will definitely come up. Well, he, I think he ended up with, uh, yeah, he ended up with life in prison. So there's another example. Worst of the worst, somebody who murdered dozens of people gets life in prison, and then people who don't kill anybody get executed. Uh -huh. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> we're seeing we're seeing that the the life of parties cases or the um what is it the the um law of parties cases uh, but you know you said a couple of things that that um uh one that yeah they, they I'm reminded of, of the the TED talk by David Dow attorney David Dow uh who has a TED talk about finding that spot where death penalty proponents and opponents agree and that spot is where a murder doesn't happen and that's really about he's talking about following the finding those people that are falling through the cracks and making sure that we catch them instead of letting them fall all the way through um the other thing that I was reminded of was the the famous Donald Rumsfeld quote about we don't know what we don't know, <laughs> which, which came out in a very, uh, he got rid of, ridiculed for that, but you just said the same thing in a different way. We don't know what we don't know. Um, but one of the things that we do know, and I enjoy this, is, is you know, the, these, these uh, chapter headings make sure I get this right you know so you've got um these little comments after the heading are you having kidding me and I'm enjoying that and then and then you're you, you talked about chapter 16 um the accurate and honest the only one that gives us a thumbs up on, on one of these arguments uh you know I want to get to some of the questions that we have but just quickly and totally 
uh, silly, but um, did anybody say why are you using those words and is there a purpose behind it? Or are you just being facetious? Well, no, uh, I, well, I was, I was pretty worked up about how awful the, the and how in, un, unjust, uh, the injustice of it all. Uh, so I was pretty worked up about it, number one. But uh, the reason I wanted to shock people, and uh, actually that comes a lot from uh, uh, my buddy Friedrich Nietzsche, who's, uh, you don't see the, but I have a whole uh, bookcase pretty much devoted to his books. Uh, absolutely brilliant, brilliant guy um, in, in so many ways. I mean, a genius. And uh, so um, he he used a lot of exclamation points and a lot. Of, I mean, he was he was trying to provoke people into thinking. That was what his goal was, not to tell you what the what the answer was, but to provoke you into thinking. And he used ex italics, exclamation points. I mean, he didn't use the F word as far as I know, but uh, he was uh, uh, polemical. And so I thought, you know, I think I'm just going to go for it. And, you know, I'm old. So, you know, they, they, they give me they give you allowances, Abe, when you're old. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they, they let you do stuff that you, they don't let you do when you're younger so okay well we have some questions the first one here that uh that's not in the q a it's in the chat um asks if um there's a way to get the book without feeding bezos without without getting it from amazon can you get it elsewhere i'm working on that uh and so yeah within the next and yeah that's a good point and uh i mean it is available on amazon but i'm definitely working on getting it into other distribution channels so that's that's in my next week or two of work to get that figured out so yeah it will be but currently no okay well i'm gonna make a shift to that but towards the end of the program um there's some questions in the q a and let's get to those um does your Andrea asks? Does do you address theological arguments in your book? I do not, because that is not my uh, not my thing. But uh, I mean, I, I don't understand enough about it. I only, uh, insofar as um, the uh, the issue of free will is really sort of a theological rather than a scientific question. Uh, I mean, uh, or a legal. I should say rather than a legal question. And uh, Kessler talked about that, uh, you know, a, a long time ago. He said uh, the concept of criminal responsibility implies the existence of a supernatural order, and it does. I mean, you have to have uh, something outside of the physical body in order to to assume free will, and that is a legal, not a legal, but a theological concept. So I don't discuss theology per se, but um, I do bring up the issue that uh, if you if you want to believe in a uh, a transcendental world, which is wh where your free will comes from, uh, that's more of a, of a uh, theological rather than a uh, legal concept. <clears throat> it makes sense that a scientist and a science, a person such as yourself is going to set that aside and get straight to things. You know, we can't, you know, we can show a tangible proof, you know, and, and obviously uh, biblical stuff is uh, something that we can believe in, but can't really see. So Kim says, I've heard a lot from death penalty abolitionists about the arbitrary nature of the death penalty, uh, like Charles was saying, regardless of what the evidence indicates, the, those with uh, without family or substantive uh, or supporters who are poor or uh, BIPOC or um, almost twice as likely to be executed than those who have support. Can you comment on the arbitrary nature of the death penalty and how that nature in itself is bullshit? Absolutely. And uh, I mean, that that's the other biggie, along with the innocence. I think that the, you know, the worst, the arbitrary thing I kind of lump in together with, oh, it's only the worst of the worst that go to death row. And it's not because it's arbitrary. And uh, Abe, I've heard you mention uh, the Supreme Court and the on the facade of the Supreme Court, equal justice under law. And as I mentioned in the book, uh, it's appropriate that it's on the facade because it is a facade uh, that uh, in another way of using the word, it is a facade that we have equal justice. We don't in any way have equal justice. And that, to me, actually, I could almost ask this as a question. I do not understand something that is so manifestly arbitrary based on all these factors. Abe, you've talked about only certain counties within the, the country that, that do it. And, and based on the, the, uh, the, the, there aren't any rich people on death row. And, uh, and by the way, Kessler had a great quote about that. 
uh, back in the 1950s. If there's all these things that we're debating now were discussed by them uh, 70 years ago. Uh, if there's even a slight risk that a man's financial means could influence his chances of suffering capital punishment, then a fair trial is only possible if we abolish either financial inequality or abolish capital punishment. <laughs> I mean, that pretty much says it. <laughs> but but uh, the thing I don't, let me throw this out as a question, because maybe some of you understand why something that is so arbitrary and so manifestly arbitrary who would not have been overturned by not this Supreme Court, but maybe some previous Supreme Court. Why, Abe, you probably know why this hasn't happened. I don't understand it. Maybe it, it, it hasn't awesome. happened because the Supreme Court is political, not uh, not judicial at this point. Um, and, and we can see that in the rulings that they're having. And we can also see that in what's happening right now, because the only cases that are getting relief, it would seem, are about whether you can have your pastor in the death chamber while they're killing you, laying hands on you and praying out loud. That's the support, that's the kind of thing that the US, this current Supreme Court rules in favor of. But are you intellectually disabled? Are you severely mentally ill? Did you get a, did you have a, actually they've now made it so you can't even have your claims of benefit, ineffective assistance of counsel hurt by federal judges. It's outrageous. And, you know, so there's, there's your answer. Um, so the and, and and the interesting thing also about the the Furman decision in 1972, U.S. versus Furman, um, you can just Google that is, um, or you can find a whole long piece about it at the in the fast and vigil section of the Abolitionist Action Committee website. That's abolition.org. But um, but the five justices that ruled in favor of Furman and struck down the death penalty laws as they existed in 1972 each had different reasoning for why they did that. And they each, I think all nine justices actually wrote something, which is a very rare thing. Uh, often people, you know, one justice will write their opinion and other, or their dissent and the others will, will, will join in on that. And I'm not a lawyer or a legal expert. So, you know, feel free to correct me if, if I'm wrong. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, and one misnomer about that is the Supreme Court never abolished the death penalty. They just said it couldn't exist as it was then. They struck it down and states were free and did write new laws. And it was four years and four days later that those new laws were upheld in the Gregg decision on um, July 2nd, 1976. And then we had our first execution, January 17th, 1977. So uh, Carol, who used to be in El Paso and is now in Nashville, asks a question. Uh, Carol Turris says, do you see persons who are strongly in favor of the death penalty buying your book or the ambivalent or those who can use the information to convince others to oppose the death penalty? I wrote, uh, I think my personal view is that nobody that, that is uh, in favor of the death penalty will buy the book. Uh, I think I'm safe there. <laughs> and I really wrote it for liberals. I, I, and some of you may know this, but uh, in California, uh, in 2019, the University of California, Berkeley did a, did a poll. And of Democrats, I have it written down here, uh, registered Democrats, 46% of registered Democrats were okay with the death penalty, 46%. Uh, that's a pretty high number. And so I wrote this book for liberals, uh, for uh, liberals that already are against the death penalty and want some arguments to go against somebody if they're arguing with somebody about it. I, I hope that this will help them. But for those 46% uh, of, uh, at least in California, 46% uh, of registered Democrats who uh, were in favor of the death penalty. I was astonished by that number. Now, when they gave them a better uh, question, which uh, death penalty versus life in prison, their uh, support went down to, to only about a third. So what this tells me is that uh, Democrats in California, and I'm sure uh, progressives elsewhere in the, in the country are the same, will uh, change their mind based on new data or based on another alternative, or I, I think they are, uh, their support is wobbly, I think is what I'm trying to say, that their support can be wobbly. The When they uh, looked at registered Republicans, it wasn't wobbly at all. They didn't change, when, when they gave them 
uh, they just stuck with it, no matter if you gave them just the death penalty or you gave them the choice between death penalty and life in prison, the death penalty was it, like nine out of 10. So uh, now I realize that you've worked with a lot of conservatives that- uh, I, I think that that's shifting. It's, and it's shifting yeah. significantly, and it all does depend. <laughs> you, know, you may not know this about me, but I came into this issue being for the death penalty. My first, uh, I went to an Amnesty International meeting on the campus of Ohio State University, and I was surprised because I'd heard about amnesty being about freeing prisoners of conscience and stopping torture and all that. And there was a speaker talking about the death penalty, and I argued with her. I said, bullshit. I said, I for an eye, <laughs> this is the United States, and we have the best justice system in the world, and if that includes the death penalty, fine with me. It turns out I was full of shit. I didn't know what I was talking about. And in trying to prove the anti-death penalty people wrong, I found out that I was wrong and I had to change my mind. Um, and I think that that's really what we know and what my own experience has been over the years is, you know, number one, if you can have a conversation, it's much better to have a conversation than an argument. It's a great way to start those conversations is by wearing a message that spurs somebody to ask a question or say, why do you feel like that? Um, and uh, uh, but at the end of the day, if people are just if if instead of arguing, you say, well, did you know about this? And you plant those seeds of doubt. Um, and that leads to our next question here uh, from Hannah, who says, I'd like to know if voters in Oklahoma would turn away from a governor who commuted a death sentence. Um, I want to address that in a moment. And, and, and back to the, the just a little bit more history in California. Um, and by the way, if you think uh, if it's OK, we can go another 10 or 15 minutes. Is that cool? OK. Um, so in 2000. 12, I think it was, uh, there was a referendum in California and uh, to try to get the death penalty out of the state constitution. And it lost pretty badly, but they brought it up again in 2016 and a little bit more strategically. And, and the shift was, um, we still lost, but we lost by just less than two percentage points. And it was a significant shift in the number. And I think that speaks to people understanding it more. And I would maintain that the California campaign, you know, it's like a union vote. You don't want to have a vote if you don't know that you're going to win. And, and that was one, one of the arguments about people you know, that people made is, you know, why are you going to spend all that money on a roll of a dice? Uh, but I can I would say that if they had a million dollars more in that campaign a couple of months earlier, they would have won it hands down because that's what it takes. But you have to buy your advertising like months in advance. And and they were kind of locked out of the out of the advertising market uh, because of that. So but what, what we know is there's always going to be those people that no matter what you say, you're never going to change their mind on both sides of the issue. Right. But there's the people in the middle who are like me that just don't know. Right. And if we get the opportunity to give them a reason to think about it differently or to actually study their motivation for it, we can shift them. Charles? I think those instruments of death, you know, the, the death chamber, the gas chamber, lynching, those are not put in to frighten people. It's put there to frighten poor people. Least likely those wealthy folks do not go against, are not even going to see that lifestyle. They're not going to get convicted of those type of crimes. You have to be convicted of a certain type of crime to be eligible for the death penalty. And those mm -hmm. all apply to the poor. I think we're all conditioned. I believe in that in society. But to poor, we have what they call a biconditional, which means if you do this, then we're going to do that. That biconditional does not apply to the wealthy or the well-to-do. It does not apply to them. Those instruments of death does not apply to them. These are the threats mm -hmm. to the poor. If you do this, then we're going to do that. Your reaction, Phil? Well, I agree completely. And uh, I mean, the fact that there aren't any, I, I don't understand why that isn't a compelling argument that there aren't any wealthy people on death row. I mean, why doesn't that, that just by itself should <laughs> should do away with the death penalty. But one thing about that, that, uh, that you mentioned, Abe, about the, you know, getting more information. And I think that's uh, the analogy I use for that, or is it a metaphor or a simile? I never get those straight, but uh, is uh, a, a sailing ship, um, if you, 
the, the wind is the passion and uh, you know moral sentiments and all that. But without the ballast of reason, the va ballast of uh, facts and evidence and reason, uh, your ship is going to tip over. And you can't have just ballast because then you're you're you can't have only reason. So you need both. Uh, and Blaise Pascal, another one of my heroes, uh, said said this: uh, that you need both uh, head and heart. He was a big proponent of you need head and heart both. And pe most people, actually on both sides, many people on both sides just use the heart and say, well, it's immoral to kill people or it's immoral not to kill people and leave it at that. And what Abe, what you're saying is when you got information about it, that was enough to change your mind. So just, just the moral level is important. You gotta have wind for the ship to go, but you also need the ballast of the facts and, and uh, reason. Uh, well, yeah, the thing that changed my mind was I was coming to understand that you have to kill an county that can afford a death penalty trial. That's yeah. the number one predictor of who's going to get a death sentence in this country. It's not what you did or who you did it to or who you are, how much money you have. It's what county did you kill in. That's yep. the number one predictor because you have to kill on a county that can afford a death penalty trial uh, where the prosecutor is willing to seek a death sentence. And to me, that didn't make any sense because the four words carved into the face of the U.S. Supreme Court building are equal justice under law. And if you can go across the county line and and not get the same punishment, um, you know, that to me wasn't equal. So I used to say then I, I would say, you know, OK, we got to make it fair and equal and then we should use it. We should kill them all. Then I came to understand the collateral damage of the death penalty. And I think this is where people really have a hard time. Um, coming away from it and still supporting is when you understand that there's families on both sides and it's not just about the victim's family. And there's also a uh, real traumatic damage that we're asking state workers to take on when they yeah. carry out executions. You know, one of our uh, leaders in our, on our board of advisors is Ron McAndrew, who is a very conservative, red-hatted Republican, but he carried out the last three ex uh, electric chair executions in, in Florida as the warden of Florida State Prison. And he talks about the men he killed coming and visiting him in his dreams, you know, and, and we yeah. know that's an impact that's happening. Um, we've got a couple of, here, of questions here that I want to be really careful with uh, because one of the unique things about our movement is that we are from across the political spectrum. We're Republicans, we're, we're um, Democrats, we're conservatives, we're liberals, we're everything in between and to the left of that and to the right of that. And we're also um, all different kinds of faiths. And, and I say that to say that this is a space where we can be safe together. Um, but also recognize that people can see things a little bit differently. And that's because the questions are about abortion and how the mix is. So, um, you know, Kim is saying it's a bullshit occurrence in the pro-life movement. Can you comment on the insanity of supporting abolishing uh, abortion, but not the death penalty? You know, I, I made a, I, I really struggled with whether to bring that issue up. And uh, I decided to avoid it because I really wanted to focus on uh, the bullshit arguments of the death penalty supporters. And uh, so I thought, you know, if I introduced anything about that, that's going to bring in all the, uh, the arguments about a, a, a different issue. Uh, and even so, anyway, long story short, I decided not to do it. You made a very wise choice to do that. <laughs> you know, it, it's, again, it come, people come from so many different places. And, you know, it's the one place I'll never forget this. I was at a meeting when I went to first went to Florida in, in uh, 1998. On the way in from Texas, I uh, um, stopped in, in Tallahassee and had a meeting hosted at the offices of the ACLU, but the Catholic conference people were there. And Larry Spalding, who uh, has since passed away, he was the, the policy guy for the ACLU of Florida. He said, Abe, this is the only place you're going to see us, the ACLU and the Catholic conference sitting together. And we still are doing that. We're doing an event in Oklahoma City in two weeks where it's co-sponsored by the Catholic Conference and Catholic Charities and the ACLU of, of Oklahoma. So we get to unite based on that, which we have in common, and we get to leave the other conversations outside so that we can be together on that which we agree on. So yeah, yeah. Um, I, yeah. 
Uh, the, the next question here, and this will be the last one from the Q&A, uh, uh, Hannah asks, um, she says, many business leaders are now pro-abolition. Would they be willing to chip in? I, well, I don't know if this is the right uh, um, answer. I can answer this question, but the question for, she's asking is, would they be willing to chip in and, and um, have they been asked about support in the cause? And I'm sure you don't know the answer to that question, but I, I thought to you anyway. <laughs> Well, so, no, I don't. I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> well, I can tell you that the answer to the question is yes. They've been asked to contribute when we can. Both well, our organization is a friend of ours here uh, in in the audience, uh, Luana. Um, yes, Luana Rose, who took it upon herself to actually engage with uh, Virgin Unite, uh, with uh, Richard Branson's uh, mm -hmm. uh, entity in England. And she wrote to them and wrote to them every month. She'd send me a copy of the letter she was writing to them Great. until we figured out who she could write to. And she got to the executive director uh, and, and they passed it on to um, the Virgin Unite Foundation. And we actually got to have a little bit of an email exchange. And then they passed us on to the Virgin Unite Foundation person Person, uh, who actually I already had a relationship with because they have uh, they hired me for a project some years ago, uh, and and then um, they're involved now in several of the state campaigns. That's just Virgin Unite, but another one of the projects of Virgin Unite and of of that of Richard Branson is this business leaders against the death penalty. I'm getting the name right. of it not quite right, but it exists, and their goal is actually not so much to get these business leaders to give money to our movement, which hopefully some of them do and will um, and are invited to. But um, they're, you know, because money does talk and bullshit walks, right? Well, the money yeah. talking, what they're really <laughs> trying to do is get um, business leaders to actually exert their influence on government officials in the states where the death penalty is being used. In other words, if we could get Mercedes Benz to make its to build its next plant in West Virginia or in Iowa or a place that doesn't have the death penalty and to have Texas and Florida and Georgia lose that opportunity because yeah. of the death penalty, that's an impact that could be had. Um, I want to mention Lush. Uh, handmade cosmetics. Uh, the, they they fund our work. They fund a number of organizations in 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 our movement. Um, in, in, and there's lots of other corporate entities that you know personally, uh, their executives actually support the work. And we're looking for more like that. Um, and you know, and that's the thing is one of the challenges to our movement is just getting enough funding to do the work. Uh, and we're in competition with so many others. Uh, there's lots of important and yeah. and, uh, and and worthy charities all over the place. Uh, you know, and we get to make do with what we're able to attract. Uh, you know, so Phil, any thoughts on the philosophy of giving? And and, and, <laughs> and thank you, by the way, for making a donation. And this is a perfect opportunity to say 70% of the revenue from your book is going to be do uh, donated directly to Death Penalty Focus, the group in California. You want to tell us a little bit about that and your motivations there? Well, uh, my goal is to get rid of the death penalty, and uh, I mean, I would I would make it 100 percent if uh, you know I, I do have some expenses, so I thought, well, and you know, it's not going to be a bestseller. The topic is not <laughs> is not something that that every every household can uh, needs a copy. But um, you know, I think that, that that with regard to the issue of donating and that kind of thing, my mantra now with regard to the death penalty, especially, is everything counts everything counts. And even if you just talk to one person about it and try to convince one person. So uh, I got this from uh, Robert J. Lifton, who's a psychiatrist who is vehemently against the death penalty, but he's in his 90s. He probably isn't involved much now. But um, Robert J. Lifton, that was became his mantra when he realized that he saw people doing things, you know, protesting or doing whatever. And he thought first he thought, oh, gee, that's just a waste of time. Then he realized, no, everything counts. And even if you can only send, you know, 20 bucks or you can only talk to one person or everything counts. So that's my that's my uh, motto now. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so Hannah reminded me she, her question was about um, if if voters turning against the death penalty might impact the get the governor there to turn away. Um, I want to say that in the governor's stead, you know, part of why they're actually using in scheduling executions, and we saw this in Arizona too, because sometimes they still think that the death penalty is a way to keep their supporters. And until we can show them enough opposition, you know, but one of the challenges, I mentioned the 2016 referendum in California, that same election day, uh, which, you know, obviously it was a, uh, an awful day in many ways uh, because of the national election that was happening, but the same, they had that referendum going on in, in California, but there was also one in Nebraska, which I mentioned earlier, one of the states where they've abolished the death penalty, the legislature, and it's unicameral, it's just a Senate in Nebraska. They voted to abolish the death penalty. Governor Ricketts vetoed that vote. They overrode the veto and made it happen, made it law. And then Governor Ricketts put his own money into a referendum that got that, uh, that overturned and brought the death penalty back. And amazingly, they were able to actually keep the people that were still on death row, even though they'd thrown out their law, and they executed one of them who'd been on death row for more than for at least 40 years at that point. And then another state was having a referendum too, and that was Oklahoma. Very few people know about this, but Oklahoma had a referendum to write the death penalty into the state constitution in 2016. Now, I went and worked with folks in Oklahoma to create a campaign to try to draw that down. We had no illusions that we would be able to, 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 to win that election, but what we did do is we brought the numbers down using earned media and direct action and, 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 and really public education every way that we could. We brought the support for the death penalty down from 72% to 66% in terms of the support of passing that referendum. And the challenge is, of course, the people just go and they, if they get that far into the ballot, they read it and people use the, the, the you know, pu push emotional buttons. And that's how you get that, that level of support because people aren't thinking it through. But we did an experiment. We did this in Florida, too, in, in in 1998, when issue one um, was there to write the death penalty into the state constitution in Florida, in Oklahoma, in the south end of the city, of Oklahoma City, we picked a red district that always votes red, 100% Republican. And we went door to door and knocked on every single door that we could get to where somebody would answer in that precinct in deep red South Oklahoma City. And the referendum passed with 66% across the state. Everywhere except for the blue spots and except for that one precinct where we beat it soundly because we went door to door and we had a conversation about the realities of the death penalty and the unnecessary uh, bit, the unnecessary need to write it in. And I say this because, you know, I don't get to tell that story very often, but the reality is that the more you know about the death penalty, the less you like it. And even if you believe there are people who deserve whatever they get coming, it, you can't trust the system. And that's the point. That's why we started using words, like, you know, signs like this. What if we got it wrong? And, yeah. and do you trust the government and stuff like yeah. that? No. <laughs> no. Did Jerry, I, you I, wanted to say? No, I I agree uh, completely with all of that, and I think that uh, that these are the kind. Well, the education part. I mean, that's really the reason why why I did this mm -hmm. was in, hope, in hopes that I could we could get a, get to enough liberals or Democrats uh, for them to, to get them the information. In California, if it's 46%, that's a, that's a large group of people that we could sway. And, and we know that on, on the death penalty in particular, Democrats are, are willing to change their minds based on new evidence. So uh, that's, and so I think all the stuff you do and uh, that everybody does to get this, the word out, it, you know, could change the, the issue. Well, Phil, I want to thank you so much for uh, giving us the opportunity to talk with you before anybody even has the book. It's it's just gone on the market, so uh, we're grateful. I want to um, give you a moment to 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 say a, a greeting. Then I've got a couple of things to show people on our way out. So, Phil, last word. Well, last word is I just want to thank all of you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk to you, and uh, and I'm 
I'm in awe of everything you do because you all, many of you have done far more than I have. I, you know, I'm sitting in my office here with Nietzsche on my shoulder and uh, typing on a computer. You guys are doing the real work. So I appreciate it. And thanks so much for having me. Well, thank you. And Phil, uh, somebody earlier asked, how do we get this book without giving any money to Jeff Bezos? And I'm going to say that the first person to go to deathpenaltyaction.org and donate 100 bucks, the book is yours. And I'll send it to you. Um, not my copy that you signed for me, but the second. <laughs> so thank you. And I want to show you all something, because uh, this is important. If you go to the front page of deathpenaltyaction.org, and you, you can find a number of different actions to take. We talked about the Shin ruling a little bit. Um, that's what this one is, the Congress. Um, and, and, and there's lots of different ways to take action. In particular, this right here, we're, we're raising money to make a film series about the death penalty. We've got about $10,000 towards the $30,000 goal to pay for this professional level. These, this, I'm going to show you their video in a minute. The, the um, uh, these folks did this, but but uh, actually we, we can donate there. But if you donate to Death Penalty Action, you'll see that right now we've got some some supporters that are going to triple your donation. So you give a hundred bucks, it turns into three hundred bucks, and we've we've got about another fifteen hundred dollars left in that five thousand dollar commitment. We're also looking people to help, uh, looking for people to join the donor pool that will continue this kind of doubling effect. So just a heads up on that. Um, and then you know, here again is that particular project uh, that we've we've, uh, um, we've somebody just. Uh, invested $5,000 in this um, effort, and we've already raised about $5,000 in this effort, and the goal was to make a film. So here's on our way out a little trailer about this, and thanks again, everybody. All right, y'all, we got a special new project, and it's all about the death penalty. We're here at the King Memorial, and we know that Dr. King taught us that change comes from the bottom up, not from the top down. So we are relying on you. We need your help. The death penalty is on its way out. We have more opposition to the death penalty than we've had in a generation. So this is our moment. Senator Durbin from Illinois and Representative Ayanna Presley, the chief sponsors in the House and Senate. And I am glad to have the chance to stand shoulder to shoulder with you in this effort. This project is all about the people who have been directly impacted, voices of experience, folks whose family members are on death row, folks whose family members have been executed, murder victims' family members who are just convinced that we can do better than the death penalty when it comes to justice. We can honor their loved ones without killing someone else. And that's all the death penalty does. Hi, I'm Abe Bonowitz. I'm the co-founder and the executive director of Death Penalty Action. And I'm asking you to do whatever you can because it's by putting the voices of experience on the death penalty in front of audiences that we change the death penalty. So you can help make it happen. We can do better than killing to show that killing is wrong. It mirrors the evil that we're trying to heal the world of. So we'll have exonerees that were wrongfully convicted on death row, maybe even folks that have been involved in the machinery of death. So we're all... ...putting our voices together to say, it's time to abolish the death penalty. I'm convinced that a generation from now, folks will look back like we look back at slavery. We're gonna be the generation to end the death penalty. We get to be a part of making history. All right, everybody, the live stream has ended, but uh, we were just grateful, Phil, and um, we can chat for a few more minutes, uh, um, see if there's any other questions here. Um,
I want to thank everybody. And again, I'll say the first person that puts a hundred bucks on the webpage there, uh, I'll send this book to you if you want it. And um, it doesn't have to be a hundred. It can be more. And we're grateful for any support. <laughs> any support that we get gets tripled until we hit $5,000. So uh, please chip in if you can. And Phil, thank you for making a donation the other day. Yes. Yes. Well, this was great. I really enjoyed this. Thanks so much. <laughs> now, we're going to do all we can to, to help uh, people know about the book. And of course, we always want yes. to support your, the, the organization in the state where you live. And you live in death penalty in California. So you're supporting death penalty focus, the California group. And that's what we all need to do. Any hey, other hey, our panel? Hey, hey this will be very easy because every time we talk about the death penalty, we're talking about bullshit. <laughs> like, so you're there you're there <laughs> all right uh sue thanks so much of course of course and hey, the, uh, a death row survivor chuck Cohane just commented said amen charles and chuck was on death row in 1972 when the death penalty got struck down and he's still alive to talk about it today and free too all right, everybody, thanks so much. Um, really appreciate your support and being here today and now back to work. We're working on COSUL in, in Texas and, and James in, in Oklahoma. And there's a few, uh, a bunch of other people that have execution dates too. So um, lots to do. Thank you. See you guys soon. <laughs>